But um, I guess thinking about that, like making the parallel back in the the seventies, and when I think about like the trajectory of personal computers and gaming, you had these specialized machines for computing. You had these very expensive computers that were in a lab, and then it took, in the case of the PC, it took like a gen like some standardization, some general purpose hardware platform, and then a an operating system, and then boom, now you have just sort of just seems like massive growth. And maybe, I, I don't know, you helped precipitate that for gaming in many ways because you brought it into the home. Are there some similarities or maybe even some differences that, that you see are, are needed for robotics and autonomous vehicles to kind of make that happen? Has there got to be some sort of standard platform to make this happen? I don't think so. Of- I, I, think that, I think that it's going to continue to be fragmented for, for quite a while. When I say quite a while, I'm talking about three to five years. I think that uh, there's this dual thread that's going on, and that's the conversion from gas and diesel to electric, and the the combination of sensor-assisted uh, accident avoidance. And then, in some ways, you know, the ways and the Google Maps and that sort of thing, it's helped a lot. I mean, I was involved in this, in ETAC, which was the early automobile navigation company. And so that link between the mapping technology and the driving technology is there in, in a lot of ways. And it just needs to be refined proven and uh, and still a little bit expensive and you and it's not to the point where you get the benefits of lower inf- insurance rates and things like that so all of that is going to take a little time but I think the trajectory is inevitable it will happen and it will happen either surprisingly fast or surprisingly slow I've never been able to predict timing very well. <laughs> With robotics, <clears throat> especially, um, it's hard to cut corners on cost. I read, um, what's it called? Tracing the Beam or Chasing the Beam? Racing right. the Beam. Fascinating book about about some of the really creative ways at which these games for like Atari were made and some of the constraints that you had to deal with, with the technology back then and to make it economical. Right. I mean, just extraordinary. A lot of people don't realize the early video games weren't even computers. They weren't von Neumann architecture. They were state machines. They were just chips. They were just chips and a clock. And we created everything in hardware. There was no, Micro- Remember, I did computer space in 1970, and uh, and <clears throat> and the microprocessor wasn't really invented until 74, and a good enough one that we could do it wasn't until 76, which which was when we did the 2600. So, you know, you kind of had to wait for the back end technology to catch up. And even though, even then, we had to put a lot of glue chips around the microprocessor to get it up to video speeds. Well, I, I remember when, when, when we put the uh, software for driving a car on a, ras- on a $30 Raspberry Pi, you were really excited about that. <laughs> I was very excited about it. <laughs> and it, it resonated with, with you. And we were able to drive a car. It had two LIDAR and radar, but the um, but basically standard sensors that you would see on these autonomous vehicles. And it drove it autonomously and it, and it avoided obstacles on a $30 Raspberry Pi, all the software. So, so, but we could never deploy that Raspberry Pi because there's safety and reliability questions and temperature ranges and all kinds of things that you deal with industrial you want your car to be able to run in 40 degree below zero weather 
you know, yeah. and during yeah. rainstorms and, you know, and all kinds of, I mean, driving a car is a really hostile environment and unpredictable. It, it, it can be. Yeah. Like how does this self-driving car deal with the bridge out and there's somebody, you know, waving a flag in front of you and saying, you know, don't cross this bridge. <laughs> you know. Well, that's where I think teleop, teleoperation will help in the short run, right? We've had vehicles, as you know, we come up to a, a corner and then there's a, there's a, a driver waving us on to go, even though we should yield to that driver in that car there for it's a truck that wanted to do like a u-turn or something probably illegally <coughs> but it's telling us it's telling our vehicle it's doing the, the guy's waving it on we can't detect that no i mean we might be right. able to when the vehicle stops you can have remote someone at a remote station just kind of drop in say oh yep move you forward a little bit and give the car a nudge to go forward that's going to be needed for some time until right all of those oddball scenarios are completely worked out. Yeah. But at least the vehicle will stop. Now, that's been a bad thing more recently in San Francisco with the cruise vehicles, as I'm sure you heard. There was a communications outage and like a, their whole fleet of vehicles or like a, at least a good chunk of them just stop and somewhere in the middle of the road and blocking emergency <laughs> vehicles and it made the news. But um that's the flip side. If you're going to do teleoperation, you really better have communications with the vehicle or else it's not right. going to go anywhere. I had an off the wall question that I, that I just remembered that I wanted to ask you. Um, if you could design a robot based entirely on your personal experiences in life, what would it be like? What would it be doing? Oh, very simple. It would be a bring me robot. So if I'm sitting watching TV, I would say, Jeeves, that would be my wake word. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Jeeves, bring me a beer. So now that's a robot beer. that does something that you would want it to do. So you want, you want the fetch me, you want the robot to fetch you stuff. Yeah. Okay. So like, so that need, that means this thing needs arms or, or does it need arms? Do you need? Do you, need do, you, do you change your environment or do you change or do you make the robot fit the environment or do you change your environment to fit the limitations of the robot? Uh, you would equip an area in your home as the as the robot pantry. And so you'd have a refrigerator that is like a stripped down vending machine so that you can load it up with Cokes and beers and what have you and encode each one of the slots so that if um, I say I want a Coke, it would go to that refrigerator and a Coke would drop onto its lap or its hand or whatever. That would work. That would work. That would work now. You could, yeah. but so, but that's like the changing, it's the classic thing with robotics and autonomy. Do you change the infrastructure and the environment to kind of make it easy for the robot to do its thing? Or do you just make that robot like, you know, anthropomorphic with all the things, all the things that humans have hands and manipulators and can do things? No, that... I think, see, if I were going to be doing a business, I'd, I'd build a robot that was pretty fun, you know, could navigate, you know, and, uh, I, you could all, as long as it could go from A to B to B to A reliably, um, then uh, you could train it and say, this is point A and this, this is point B. And, uh, and then I would price the robot relatively low compared to cost. So maybe normally you want a 50% margin. Maybe I'd sell the, bot, the robot at 20% margin. But then all the other stuff, the automatic popcorn maker and the automatic coffee maker and the uh, automatic and the, the refrigerator, I'd mark those up. And once you got people hooked on the robot, then they'd make a lot of money on the peripherals. Ah, there you go. And the accessories. See, it's a little bit like, you know, Nespresso. They give those things almost away at cost because they make... Uh, 
you know, six cents. The same thing with the HP uh, printers. Yeah. Printers. They make yeah. more money on the cartridges than they do on the printer. On the recurring, yeah, the recurring revenue. Yep, that makes perfect yeah. sense. So you answered the, sort of the question, what would you like to see? And that's, I agree with you. Like that's that utilitarian aspect of it. But I know you're also a big entertainment guy, right? You tell me, but I think that you think <laughs> that, that, you, that, that people like to be entertained, right? And so should we be making robots that are just utilitarian or, or should they be like your in-home court jester or something? I think an in-home court jester. I... <laughs> I, I think that uh, it would really be fun to have the robot meet you at, when you come in and say, you know, and tell you the joke of the day. And, uh, you know, or maybe it knows what your portfolio is and, he's, and it says, sir, I think I need to get you a martini. Your stocks really did horribly. <laughs> You know, or something like that, you know, basically, you know, once, once you have all this stuff online and, uh, like my, uh, Amazon echo, I'm not going to say the A word, right? but, uh, they know what my, what my appointments are and, and, and she will tell me that, uh, Hey, you've got a, an appointment, you better go for it. And, I like that. It's like having a, an almost personal assistant. And for some reason, my wife hates her. <laughs> That's interesting. So why, why is that? Like, what's, what, what is your theory there? I call her a Luddite, but I think that, it's, <laughs> that she just doesn't want any kind of competition, even if it's, if it's, uh, a disembodied voice coming out of a little round speaker. <laughs> little secret here too. My wife hates Miss. A. We call her Miss A because you can't say her name. I'll say it. Janie's a lot, a lot of it too. And uh... <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, see, I would have. I've got probably half of the lights around. You know, like outside and things like that. They're all voice controlled. And, you know, and, and I'm very happy to go out and say the A word and then deck on. And, um, uh, and I've, I've got a dimmer on that one. So I can say, um, lights 50% and they kind of outside. So I can have a cocktail and then I say, you know, play me, a, play me some queen or, <laughs> or, or Bach or, Pachelbel, <laughs> you know, I find that really rewarding. I, I, I just get a giggle out of it. I hope you enjoyed the show Driven with me, Paul Perone, your host. Don't forget to check us out at driven.show on the web and give us a thumbs up or subscribe here if you like the show. Thank you for listening in. See you soon.